Hello and welcome to the Political Orphanage, a home for glib thinkers, friendly nerds, and the obscenely, inappropriately good-looking. I'm your host, Andrew Heaton, and today we are going to talk about the insecurities of the working class, the causes of their problems, and potential solutions to them. It's a very good conversation with one of my all-time favorite guests, Bacha Unger Sargon, who I absolutely adore. I would, at some point in life, I would love to have a show where either I am her co-host or she is mine. She is an absolute delight, despite the fact that she is a capital M Marxist. And it always weirds me out, not just how much I like her, but how much I agree with said Marxist. Theoretically, we should be trying to kill each other with rakes. And yet... We have a lot of overlap. I, I don't know how that works, but I do know that you're going to have a good time listening to her and have a good time with our conversation. So enjoy. My guest today is Bacha Unger Sargon. She is an editor at Newsweek, a fairly universally beloved political analyst, at least in the circles that I travel in, and certainly amongst me. She's been on the program a couple of the time, a couple of times, and uh, and I'm very happy to have her back, and specifically to talk about the new book that Bacha has written, Second Class: How the Elites Betrayed America's Working Men and Women, which you can find at Amazon or bookstores or MightyHeaton.com/featured, where you'll find that book as well as all of the books that we have discussed on this program. And before I, I say hello to Bacha, I also want to note, she doesn't think anybody from this program is going to buy her book. So here's what I want you to do. Bacha has preemptively negged you before even hearing Bacha's voice. She's, listeners, she's already negging you. If, if, like we were talking off mic and she went, let's be honest, none of your listeners are going to buy my book. So let's just have a fun chat. And I was like, don't disparage my listeners. So here, if you buy your book, tweet Bacha. Bacha, what is your, what is your Twitter handle so you can know how literate? <laughs> and challenging my audiences. <laughs> um, my Twitter handle is at Bungar Sargon. I said that because I feel like I am like the heel to the libertarians that they like to kick around because I, I love debating and they always think they are winning and I always think I'm winning. Um, uh -huh. I said it with total love. But I mean, yes, buy my book, but also like I'm here not to sell books, but to have fun with you and your audience. Right. And I know we're Wonderful. gonna have a great conversation. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Uh, well, I'm I'm delighted to have you back. I I always enjoy uh, talking to you. Uh, in in the TV show I was working on recently, uh, you were a guest on that program. I and I was I was insistent. I was like, Bacha is amazing. You're gonna love her. L literally on that show, we we nearly did an outro where Bacha did the outro because she was <laughs> so much more delightful than me that no one wanted me to be the host anymore. Uh, so uh, yeah, all of that is true. Um, well, so let's let's uh, talk about your book, uh, Second Class, How the Elites Betrayed America's Working Men and Women. Um, let's let's kick it off by defining a couple of terms because they come up in your book a lot. Uh, what is the American dream and what is the working class? How do we define working class? Um, great. So the, for to define the American dream, um, I looked both at polling. So how, you know, pollsters have found that, you know, tens of thousands of Americans what would they define the American dream at? And of course, for the book, I traveled around the country for a year and interviewed about 100 working class people in different industries. And of course, this was the question I asked every single one of them is, how do you define the American dream? And their definitions hewed very closely to the polls. Um, so, so the American dream is defined by the majority of Americans or many, many, many working class Americans as um, owning your own home, um, being able to retire in dignity, um, having adequate health care and affordable health care and your children having at least as many choices or opportunities as you did. Those were the sort of that was the most okay. common, but also the most modest version of the American dream. And, and the thing that sort of spurred me to write this book is how much we in the elites, and I know we're going to define that as well, how much we take those things for granted while people who you know, inarguably work much harder than us in much more physical jobs, can't access or achieve these incredibly modest hallmarks of a stable American dream, stable life. Okay. Um, hey, that definition works for me. It seems like we're, we're going to use a, an economically rooted definition of the American dream as something involving opportunity, stability, and not being terrified about basic things we all agree are important. That Okay, great. Uh, it comes up a lot in the book, and 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 it also seems that the the 
instigating factor of you writing the book was that kind of deep insecurity and feeling of not being able to get traction uh, from people in the working class. One of the things that's ever present in your book that I think is good to remind elite people or cosplaying elite people like me is that working class folks want to work. Um, that's something that was recurrent. Every single person in your book, I don't think a single person in your book, um, and I, I believe the data backs this up too, so it's not merely anecdotal, was of the opinion, I want a government handout so I could sit home and and play video games. Like All of them really valued working hard, like really valued the the ethos of work. It was that they felt that there was a disconnect between the effort that they were putting into work and the traction that they were gaining in life uh, and a kind of a uh, societal lack of respect for the kind of work that they were doing. They felt very disposable and very um, uh, kind of second class, as is in the title of your book. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, it was one of the first things I noticed was work for the people I interviewed had an almost spiritual component to it. They saw it as an inheritance from their parents. They remember seeing their parents get dressed and go to work every day. And they were deeply proud of that inheritance and deeply proud of the work they did. They got a lot of self-esteem and dignity from their labor. What was undignified about it was exactly like you said, they couldn't get any traction. And I think maybe one of the places where um, there's a lesson here for the for the libertarians out there uh, is, you know, I, I think libertarians feel very keenly that, um, you know, hustle should be rewarded, that you know, there should be no limit on opportunity and industriousness. And the harder you work, the more you put into it, the more striving you are, the longer hours you're willing to put in. There shouldn't be some sort of um, artificial impediment to how much you can rise based on your own talents. And I am completely with you there. The problem for me is that most of these people who work in working class jobs Many of them are doing jobs that actually require patience and not being exceptional or perhaps being exceptional at sitting in traffic in a huge rig or being exceptional at dealing with old people with dementia, jobs that don't necessarily require um, a kind of entrepreneurial spirit, the opposite. They require people who are satisfied to do things the same thing over and over. And actually, our entire society relies on people like that, whose work is interchangeable with other people's. And it is those people who have really been left behind by the knowledge industry, by the hustle culture, by the meritocracy. I mean, I'm sure we would agree the meritocracy is not working perfectly. If you are a kid growing up in an inner city, you don't have equal opportunity. Even if you have an IQ of 180, there's very little you'll be able to do with it if you live in you know, gang-infested territory or in some you know, broken down rural community. But there is a lot of opportunity. I agree with the libertarians there. There are a lot of kids from you know less privileged backgrounds who do have an IQ of 180 and do make it to Harvard and do make it up the ladder, do become wealthy. And But there's a lot of people who we rely on not wanting that. I mean, who we rely on wanting a more modest version of a stable middle-class life in order to, to survive, right? We want truck drivers who are happy to sit in a rig for 12 hours a day, jobs we could never imagine doing. And yet we have become totally satisfied to be hoarding the majority of the GDP in these knowledge industry jobs and say to those people, I need you to do that boring job that I could never do and you will never be able to afford a home. And I think that there's mm. something about that that's fundamentally unjust. I I largely agree with everything you just said. Um, uh, one, one of the things that uh, there, there's a place I go to on Fridays here in Austin. Um, it's going to sound less frivolous than what I'm about to say, but it's called the Wizard Academy. It's actually just a bar. <laughs> there are no wizards. It, there's, it's nothing to do with Harry Potter, but it's called the Wizard. It's wonderful. If you're ever here, I'll take you out there. I really enjoy it. Um, w one, of the, uh, one of the directors of this particular place that I go, uh, I was hanging out with a couple of my friends one time with him and uh, libertarianism came up and he went, you know, all the libertarians I know are really smart, successful people. <laughs> They're really smart and successful and like laudably. Like, like, and he was just like, I don't know that you guys are designing a system that is for everybody that's not smart and successful. And like, you know, I do think freedom works very well, Bacha, for everybody, but it did give me pause of there might be some 
there might be some priors that need to be investigated. Where I will also very much agree with you, it, one, nobody should be terrified of like not having a place to live. Nobody, sh nobody should be terrified economically in this prosperous country if they're willing to engage in work. I, I don't, I don't want um, fear of absolute existential collapse to be a motivator for people. I don't think it should be, uh, and, and hard work should be motivated. The other thing I'll add is. I, I think that the meritocracy that you allude to is largely bullshit, uh, and I think that we would we would agree very much on this. One of the things I really enjoy about your work and where I have – the two things that I've come around to the Marxist position on are, one, I think that a lot of the rancor in the United States is not blue versus red or conservative versus progressive. I think it, it is increasingly a class struggle between elites, managers, and um, working class dive bar. Uh, which comes through in your work. And I, I think that your epistemology is actually much more useful and functional in that regard. But then the other bit that I'm kind of like wholesale on now is college. Like I think the Marxists are right about yeah. college and universities where we're, we're going to basically design this national caste system in the United States where you yeah. take one test at the age of 16 and that for the rest of your life determines your trajectory. And if you just happen to be one of the people that doesn't test very well, or doesn't really want to do liberal arts education because you want to go be a welder or whatever, all of society for the rest of your life goes, well, you're kind of a moron and you, you just, you didn't participate. you you get to be a loser. And then on top of that, um, even if that worked, maybe, but like you look at like Harvard, something like 60% of these students that go to Harvard are there on the Dean's list or an athletic scholarship. The Dean's list means that their parents gave Harvard a bunch of money or that there were legacy and Harvard noted that. So that's a roundabout way of saying 40% of the people who went to Harvard are arguably there based on meritocracy. 60% are not there due to meritocracy. They're there to financial resources of their family or nepotism. So like then telling those, those people get to be elite forever in our society. And if you didn't go there, they outrank you forever. That is not a meritocracy. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of like weird recycled privilege system that we all engage in collectively. Yeah, it's an oligarchy of the credentialed. And, you know, minimally, I totally agree with you. These people are not exceptional. They're not smart and they're not educated. But maximally, I would say like the Obama model in which we should be ruled by like the super smart and the super educated and the super credentialed. I don't th I think that's anti-democratic, too. I mean, the majority of the people, if they want a policy, it should happen in a functioning democracy. And what I found in my book was that the majority of liberals and conservatives who are working class agree on the majority of the issues like the vast majority of the issues, you know, there, nothing distinguished the gay certified nurses aide in Florida who votes for Biden from the Trump supporting uh, West Virginia Amazon driver, uh, you know, who I interviewed. I mean, they have the exact same ideology when it comes to, you know, LGBTQ issues. They're both super pro gay and super worried about the trans stuff. They're both very worried about immigration and feel it drives down their wages. They're both very supportive of expanding healthcare so people don't go into medical debt. I mean, like nothing distinguished these two women from each other. And I found that to be fascinating. I will say it's not just that you like if you don't go to college, you're a loser. You're like I, the reason I called it second class is because that that economic anxiety you described as this thing that is ever present for working class people, you know who doesn't have that is the poor who are living off the government, who have chosen to live off of welfare. And there was so much um, frustration about that among the working class. And I think this is the thing that that is missing maybe from the, the division between left versus right is we have this ideology, you know, in America that like the right believes in the trickle down and the left believes in the welfare state, you know? And that the person who's on the side of the little guy should care, you know, should want to expand the welfare state. But the working class people that I interviewed, they don't want welfare. And they saw an economy that, which is what we have right now, that caters to the over-credentialed college elites on the one hand and then the dependent poor on the other, as those are both in tension with an economy that rewards their labor in a dignified manner. Like they don't want the, an expanded welfare state. They are totally mm -hmm. against that. Like you pointed out in your first your first point that the people in my book really respect work. And I think that there's, you know, when I talk to libertarians, they're always like, well, you know, redistribution and welfare doesn't work. And it's like, yeah, these people don't want redistribution. They don't want higher taxes. They, they that's not That's not what they want. It's amazing because the working class in America has come up with an idea of what an economy that protects their labor would look like. And it's like neither party gets it. Although somebody who really gets it, I'm sure we'll get into this, is, is Trump. I mean, he really did understand that there was 
a third way down the middle and that you know the mid 60 percent of americans would go for that you know like this idea of like th the working class people i interviewed were radically radically moderate which is why you have a person who votes for Biden, a person who votes for Trump, and there's like no daylight between them because neither of the parties really speaks to where these people are at. One of my favorite lines in your book, um, I, I believe it is, polarization is an elite phenomenon. Working class people don't have time for that or something to that effect. I don't have it right in front of me, but I love that it, I, I, I set the book down for a minute to contemplate that of, yeah, most of this like intense uh, uh, affected polarization, red versus blue, like it is largely elites that are having this slap fight. And uh, in, in, in my experience, to your point, uh, granted, my experience is, is a lot more limited than yours in terms of talking to working class people because you've physically gone out and done a, a year long journey to interview people. But in my experience, the people that are most skeptical of welfare are working class people because yeah. they've also seen it abused. So they like they're the, the attitude that totally. I have gotten is I work really hard and I know that my cousin is leeching off the system and um, I, I don't want to give the leech more money. I, I just want to make more money, something to that effect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's it's amazing because I was interviewing, um, you know, I'm sure we're going to get to this, but, you know, in trying to come up with a definition of working class. I interviewed a whole bunch of academics who, you know, really study this and they kept like all the academics, of course, are like far left, right? All the, so the sociology is like the, one of the wokest of the wokest of the disciplines. It's like all garbage. And, you know, they would say, like, I remember I had this conversation with this one um, sociologist and he said to me, I said to him, you know, the people I'm interviewing, they have a, a like a very high suspiciousness around welfare. They don't like it. They all, I said, they don't like it. And he said, um, yeah. Thanks, Reagan, you know, starts <laughs> quoting to me like all of this like welfare These stupid, queen. Po stupid poor people exactly. that got hoodwinked and are voting against key exactly. phrase, voting against their own interests, exactly. which I know better than them. Exactly. And I said to him, no, they all know people who are doing it. Like they all know people who made that choice. But, you know, it's easy to sort of like take that position, like, you know, people choosing to live off the government. But I also found something that was extremely infuriating, which is called the benefits cliff. So mm -hmm. if you have, a let's say, a single mom, right, and she's working part time, you know, at a big box store, she's making 11 bucks an hour, right? And she has a kid and maybe the kid has a disability or something. And so the kid has Medicaid, which is like the Cadillac of healthcare insurances, right? And her boss notices her and he's like, she shows up to work on time every day. She never calls out sick. If there's a problem with the kid, she calls her mom. She's so reliable and says to her, hey, I want to give you a raise. I want to get you to $16 an hour full time and we'll get you health care benefits. You know, what do you say, right? If she takes that raise, she will be giving up $25,000 a year in government benefits, food stamps, housing assistance, child care, and of course the Medicaid. And now even though her boss is saying, I'm going to give you health care, she cannot know ahead of time whether that health care will cover what her child needs or whether it will be one of these crappy health cares with a six thousand uh, dollar a deductible and premiums through the roof and whether the child will even be able to keep seeing his therapist so you know in a way it's like everybody would want to take that raise including this woman but if she's a mother who cares about her child i mean she can't take that raise she cannot take that raise because she will lose all of the things that make her life workable. What I'm saying is, is that we are incentivizing all of the worst behaviors. We know that getting married is one of the best things a woman can do for the upward mobility of her children. If she gets married, she again loses all of these benefits. Why are we incentivizing the worst behaviors? And then we're punishing people who make all of the right decisions. I mean, that was the thing that came up again and again, that people said to me, they know people who are choosing to live off the government, but the people they saw as deserving, you know, this woman in West Virginia who drives for Amazon she would say to me, you know, I know these people, they work so hard and they can't afford groceries. Why is there no help for them? But there is endless help for people who make all the wrong decisions. That's what makes them feel like suckers and like second class citizens because they're eating it from the top and they're eating it from the bottom. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I brought on someone very, very different from you, Phil Graham, uh, last year, the former senator from Texas, uh, who did a, a book about inequality. And one of the things he brought up was um, when you look at uh, uh, 
government, what do you call it? Government benefits, both in terms of cash and in kind services and benefits Mm -hmm. that the, the, the lowest quintile of the American electorate gets about $45,000 per person on average. And and the things you mentioned, food stamps and in housing allotments and childcare, et cetera, et cetera. And, and he, his point was that the people that are just above that line really have a lot to be resentful of because they're not making as much as everybody else. They're working really, really difficult jobs, and they're basically making as much money as the people that aren't working. Um, it's and horrible. So, yeah. and, and, and I mean, I know we're going to talk about immigration, but and, and I know you don't agree with this, like putting immigrants up and giving them endless you know, health care rights. They gave them in New York debit cards with $10,000 on them at a time when American families can't afford hamburger meat. And, Wait, hold on. And, I don't know about this. They gave debit, yeah. debit cards with $10,000? Yeah. How- how did this just to anybody that wanted it or did they have like, was it a like pilot program for UBI or what was the, that's a lot of money. No, how how was, did they do this? It was only for illegal immigrants. Huh. They gave illegal immigrants debit cards with $10,000 on them at a time when American families cannot afford hamburger meat. It is so disgusting. And if they, if working class people complain about this, they call them racist. Like the whole thing is and why why are they doing this? Because the the elites that employ these people, they make those ten thousand dollars back in spades because they don't have to pay American workers American wages. They can instead hire illegal immigrants, right? So it's of course, you know, people will say, why do the rich want to pay so much in welfare? Why do they want to pay so much higher taxes that go to these people, the indigent? Because at the end of the day, it is in their economic interest. And I think that is the thing that is so despicable about the why is the working class voting against their economic interests? They're not. They're voting against the economic interests of the elites. They're voting in their economic interests. And when they do that, they get called racist to hide the scam, the plunder. It is a plunder of the middle class by the college educated elites. And every item on the Democrats platform it, it, it is doing this, whether it's, you know, the Green New Deal, right? All of these subsidies for people who want a Tesla, you know, you want to buy a Tesla, you have $65,000 sitting in your bank account for a Tesla. The government will give you $12,000 back to buy a car that is basically only good for driving 12 blocks to Whole Foods and back if you live in Brooklyn or San Francisco, you know, like this is total, first of all, it's not affordable, but it's totally not feasible if you live in rural America, if you use your car for work. I mean, who's going to pay for the hour you have to sit there, you know, putting electricity in this thing, right? It's so so gross it is an upward transfer of wealth from the working class to the college educated elites and on that note one of the stats that you had in the book that made my jaw drop was that federal and state governments give 150 billion dollars a year in higher ed grants and they give 1 billion to votech so 1 it's billion to votech like you know working class trade jobs th- things skills uh, and 150 billion. It's to actually the folks 200 that, billion. Yeah, when 200 I wrote the book, for, it was, yeah, it's yeah. up to 200 billion. It's it's so disgusting, and that was on on purpose. President Obama completely defunded vocational training and took all that money and put it into pr- mass producing, you know, gender studies podcasters and and you know, s- civil rights attorneys and all this nonsense. You know, it's 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 so it's so appalling. Can I can I I want to pause you real quick just because I want to make sure I understand something you said earlier that is that is new to me. Um, uh, typically the way that, that the argument on welfare and taxes is portrayed is, uh, Democrats are, uh, really, really empathetic and heart based people who might be wrong about the economic outcome. Whereas, uh, Republicans are very pro growth fiscal conservatives, uh, who might be selfish. So something like that, but, but you're almost describing that debate as like two different like you, you, you have the cartoon Koch brother model um, on the one hand, which we're already familiar with, but that the other one, that kind of Warren Buffett, like uh, attacks me more. Um, that 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 is a kind of sleight of hand, if I'm understanding you. That the the elites on the on blue team are uh, sure higher taxes and more welfare benefits, but that the the um, expanded cheap labor from open immigration and so on and so forth more than doubles the income and so it's like take take that on the chin but it's overall like it's that's not a sympathetic position it's actually a self-interested position that's what you're positing 100 percent, and i'll give you the data point that really proves it so 1971 was the high water mark for working class wages and we can talk about a lot of things that went wrong after that but um the share of gdp 
1971 that belong to the billionaire class has not significantly changed. So in 1971, the biggest share of the GDP was in the middle class. And there was, you know, a certain portion in the billionaire class and then whatever redistributed. Today, the share of the GDP that that the billionaire class owns and controls has not significantly changed since the high watermark of working class wages. Do you know what has changed? Is that the top 20% now controls over 50% of the GDP. So there has been a middle class squeeze in both directions. The working class was squeezed down, but a lot of people were squeezed up into this top 20%. And they are the ones who represent the real shift in the biggest section of the GDP, which is now controlled by the college educated. And to mask this, they developed this whole tax us more redistributive model um, because it's the perfect alibi, right? You know, you could do two things. Me- you can meanwhile, say, we'll, we'll rant about the top 1% who pay 45% of all tax exactly. expenditures. And so that's kind of a canard. The, like, if I'm understanding you correctly, the 1% basically is the same as it was since 1970. Like, w- Warren Buffett's still Warren Buffett. That's not changed. The difference is me, Andrew Heaton, and the top 20%, we've, like, there's been a cleave between the median, and we now have, like, a, a got a bra-shaped distribution curve. Yeah. Where there's people that are lower middle class and upper middle class, but the middle middle class is atrophied. And those of us that made the top shift, we're the ones that are hoarding the wealth. And we don't want to talk about it because we like to think we're on the side of the little guy, something like that. We're not only hoarding the wealth, we're hoarding the American dream. So, you know, it used to be you would have a doctor and he would marry his nurse. You'd have a lawyer and he'd marry his secretary. Today, the mm-hmm. doctor marries another doctor and then they buy a home for a million dollars and then they join the board and they pass zoning laws and make it illegal to build duplexes in their neighborhood so their cleaning lady has to drop travel an hour and a half in order to get to them because she can never afford to live in their name neighbor- like they're hoarding the american dream opening the border right they develop these high-minded sounding virtues which are in effect a cover story for an upward transfer of wealth right Why don't you care about the indigent of other countries? We should have an open border. Having a border is racist, right? And meanwhile, they're importing a slave caste to work in their homes and look after their children and clean their toilets and do their landscaping and work in their restaurants, which is literally putting tens of thousands of dollars back in their pockets. Like, where? how did they get all of this GDP, right? How did they start? How did they come to control over 50% of the GDP? It was through a whole bunch of actual policies passed by Democrats, right? President Obama defunding um, um, uh, uh, vocational training and putting all that money into into university. Bill Clinton signing NAFTA into law, which ships all these good paying jobs overseas in exchange for importing cheap goods for the elites, right? Meanwhile, their neighbor can't afford to buy a home anymore. Opening the border, all of this stuff were policies that shifted the GDP towards the college educated at the expense of the working class. Mm. Well, let's get into that in a moment. I want to touch on one more thing because I I think you and I are going to cleave when it comes to trade and immigration. I I, I maintain all the hagiography of Milton Friedman and all, all of the, all of the <laughs> hymns of my people. I still sing them. Uh, so I think we'll depart on that. But I'm very much with you on college. I think like I'm I'm not saying college is bad. I think college has basically been exacerbated into a scam. Uh, I, I I talked about this recently on another episode that I did, a really a big deep dive in the economics of the 1950s that I'm more familiar with. I, I think we ought to look at college the way we look at people who speak Latin. Uh, if you speak Latin, <laughs> that is impressive. Um, you are almost certainly an intelligent, well-educated person if you speak Latin. But I would not look at someone who doesn't speak Latin and go, what a fucking moron, doesn't even speak Latin. But see, like, I, 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 I think it's much worse than that because, you know, it used to be if somebody spoke Latin, they probably had a certain education. And part of that education was a sense of noblesse oblige. So the elites used to have a sense that, you know, they didn't really earn this. Like God had some sort of plan. He's, you know, obviously he makes some people really good looking and some people really not. He makes some people really rich and some people not. And if you are the beneficiary of such a boon, you owe something to the community who it has come at their expense. And so the elites used to build institutions and they would build hospitals and they would care for the people who worked for them. Like they had this sense of humility 
vis-a-vis their good fortune. But the myth of the meritocracy allows these nincompoops to believe that because they studied for the SATs, therefore they deserve to perpetually be making a million dollars more a year than the people who work so much harder for them, cleaning their homes and servicing them and delivering their groceries and all of this stuff. And so they feel that they owe nothing. And it's worse than that, right? They have come to hate the working class. I mean, there is such a deep contempt for the working class. And that's where the hatred of Trump really stems from. I really believe this because Trump is not, you know, they paint him as an extremist, but Trump is actually, he's, he's a 90s era Democrat. He's a New Deal Democrat. I mean, he represents labor in exactly the same way that the Democrats did. His view on abortion is the view that the Democrats had as recently as the 90s. He's courting unions. He's courting black voters. I mean, he's dead center. Every single one of his opinions is dead center. And he represents the laboring class that the Democrats abandon. And because of that, it's like the return of the repressed. Like they have to destroy him because he's such an indictment of the failures of the Democrats to cater to the people they still pretend are their base, who they have abandoned for the people that we think are, you know, the, the thing that's wrong with this country, which is the college-educated elites. My, my head is spinning. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Bacha, among the various attributes I, I, I give you as my friend, one of them is Marxist. So in my my capital M, by the way, I, I, I mentioned you on a podcast recently uh, uh, my my friend Bacha, comma full blown full blown Marxist or something like that, and somebody wrote me an angry email. And they're like, "You should." I was like, "No, she. We talked about this. This is she is a Marxist. Like like the the fact that my Marxist friend Bacha is a is stumping for Trump, uh, or at least a pot. Like my head is swimming. Um, okay, so uh, we'll we'll I'm sure we'll come back to Trump. I want to talk about uh NAFTA, labor, immigration, selling out everybody for a minute. So um. Uh, I'm going to take a deep breath and, and and explain where I'm coming from, and I want you to tell me where I'm going wrong in this because I'm, okay, I'm open. And before you do that, just uh-huh. a reminder, everybody, you can order Second Class on Amazon. Uh, Second Class, How the Elites Betrayed America's Working Men and Women. Now would be the time to do it because <laughs> this is where Andrew and I are going to big time diverge. <laughs> Well, you know what? Not, right. not only not, not only are we going to put that plug in. Um, so, hey, gang, if you listen, if you listened to my 1950s episode, I, Bacha, I did a, a really, really big deep dive on were the 1950s easier than they are now. I did a two about a three hour episode. It was a really, really uh, well researched episode, and some of the research I did was from the book that you and I are describing right now. Some of the figures that I got were out of your book. And one of the economic lessons that I, I read up, brought up brought, uh, brought up briefly in there, which was new to me and brilliant, was that when we're talking about housing, which is a big part of this equation, uh, and uh, I, I acknowledge when uh, uh, neoliberal twits like me bring up that TVs are cheaper, that housing is a much bigger source <laughs> of uh, instability than gadgets. So I, I acknowledge that. Um, one of the things you brought up in the book that I learned from you and the economists you brought on is that... Um, uh, housing is not a demand problem; it's a supply problem. I already kind of knew that, but the, you you further explain that, and you go if if there were a an auction for houses, there's say there's twenty people that want to buy a house. There's ten houses. The the ten people with the most money are going to buy those houses in an auction. The ten people with the least amount of money are not going to be able to buy those houses. And what we're effectively doing with Section Eight housing and other forms of demand problems is the government goes, oh, there's not enough money for houses. We're going to give everybody a thousand dollar tax break for a house. Okay, now we've got that same scenario. We've got 20 people that want to buy a house at an auction and all of them now have a thousand dollars extra that they can use in that auction. What's going to happen? There's still only 10 houses. The result is now those houses just cost more. And by the way, you don't get to keep the thousand dollars because it's a tax break. So all you did was drive up the price of housing and made a, a bigger gulf. Like I learned that from Botch's book. So for the people that are hardcore, all caps, underlined libertarian, let me assure you, there are things in the book that will not just challenge you, but will <laughs> educate you and affirm some of your prior beliefs. Uh, and once you read it, please tweet Botcha to let her know that I did have <laughs> listeners um, that bought the book. So, okay, <laughs> noting that, let's let's uh, uh, set me right on trade for a minute, because I think that is something that we cleave. So th- this is where I'm, I'm coming from, broadly speaking. Um, there's a concept called comparative advantage. That's the idea that uh, France is really good at making wine. Scotland's really good at making sheep. If if uh, Scotland tries to tax incoming French wine to protect the horrible, horrible Scottish <laughs> wine industry that is like 
treacle, like hay flavored wine and stuff like that, uh, then, then France is very apt to put tariffs on sheep to protect the effete, uh, anemic French sheep industry. And the result is that we have less sheep and we have less wine and they're more expensive. And it's actually much better for both countries to go, look, you're much better at making wine. We're much better at making sheep. Why don't we make a lot of sheep and very little wine? You make a lot of wine, very little sheep. And that benefits everybody and it reduces the price and, and the, it just it, across the board, everything's good, right? So that's foundation one. Foundation two, it's not a zero sum game because economies can grow. They are dynamic. And then the third bit, which is probably the, the most specific to this NATO argument, uh, and, or not NATO, excuse me, NAFTA argument and exporting jobs, uh, the the export economy in the United States right now is about 12% of GDP. Um, we, we have more exports now than we have at any point in any, any year of the 1970s. Um, I think every year since 2006, we've, we've had more exports than any year in 1970 in terms of sheer tonnage, in terms of money generated in the United States. So I look at that and go, well, our export economy is booming. It's not that the export economy went away. It's not that we exported jobs. It's that we got really productive at it uh, in the same way that we make more food than we ever have, but we have less farmers. It's not because we got rid of farmers. It's because the farmers got really, really good. So I don't think the problem is foreigners or foreign trade. I think the problem is robots if we want to define it as a problem. So I don't think taxing goods coming in from France is going to solve that. Where am I going wrong? It's actually even worse than that. My husband pointed out to me, like right after I finished writing the book, that um, we're all only two percent of GDP are imports from China. Like I'm always railing yeah. against China and China, and he's like, "Are you like is is your whole book like on you know?" I just gave you the data point that's like you really shouldn't have written this book. Like it's only two percent of our GDP <laughs> by, is imports by the from way, China. Real quick. Uh, I, I went out with Bacha and her husband about a year ago, and it was really funny because I th I thought I was going to be the fly in the ointment, and her husband's way more libertarian than I am. And like by the end of it, he didn't call me a cuck, but you could see it in his eyes that, that he he was like like you moderate doily of a man. Like it was it was really funny. Like I just kind of sat back at one point. Yeah, um, so they're delightful couple, delightful couple. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I look at that and go, well, um, I, I think that the, uh, uh, you're, you're, you are suffering and you have, uh, you have lo lower money is we've exported your job to another country is just straight up false. You, you're getting all these cheap goods from China, which makes it easier for you to exist. But, but our, our export economy didn't go away. It just got automated. So how, how would taxing goods coming in from China fix anything? Um, it's a very, very important question. And, um, you know, the thing is, is that what makes things from China so much cheaper? Um, what is their competitive advantage over us? It's not rare minerals, you know, it's not that they're better at building stuff. We know that Chinese goods fall apart, right? There's like a stereotype about that for a reason. It's they're not Japanese, like it's not Japan, right? What actually is their competitive advantage? It's slave labor. It's it's the fact that they are willing to mistreat their workers. And that is a real problem. That, that I don't think that that is a competitive advantage. And in fact, China and Mexico are very different in this way. And this is why Trump's, you know, he got he he, he got rid of NAFTA, which he promised to do in 2015. And the USMCA, um, every car that enters the US, in order for it to enter from, from Mexico with zero tariffs, 70% of the car has to be made by somebody who made at least $16 an hour. That's like impossible in China. That is possible in Mexico, but that immediately alleviated the downward pressure on wages. I'm not saying Americans are in, and the auto workers are working for $16 an hour, but if you're competing against people making $16 an hour, that's very different than competing against people who are making $4 an hour. And yeah, $4 an hour could be a middle class wage in China. But the thing is, is like people keep saying to me, well, Batya, like, isn't NAFTA just kind of like, you know, some things go the way of the horse and buggy. Aren't you fighting against progress? The thing is, like, people are still doing those jobs. They're just doing them somewhere else. Like, it's not like no, it's not like people are not building cars. Like, there is still a line. Yeah, there's fewer auto workers. There is more automation, but there's still required a lot of people to make a car, and in fact, a lot more people to make a gas car than to make an electric car. And what I think, you know, why are we subsidizing? you know, the kind of car that requires less labor. So I think the idea, you know, that these this is somehow like um, something we have to accept as an inevitability is not true. And we have examples in the economy 
of, you know, tariffs working at protecting American laborers without driving up the costs. And the perfect example of that is steel and aluminum. So when Trump came into office, he immediately said, we are not going to let, you know, China undercut us in steel and aluminum. The average steel worker in America, who, by the way, works in the South, meaning they're working in right to work states, right? So they're not unionized. So the average non-unionized steel worker in America makes $88,000 a year, which in the South is a solidly middle class wage, you know, definitely worthy of protection. Trump took on the left and the right. You know, if you think the leftists don't want cheap stuff from China, like, you know, it's like these wind turbines from China, they want that, those slave made wind turbines as much as the right does. Um, so he said, we're, we're going to protect this industry. He slapped a 25% tariff on steel and aluminum. And all the economists, like wall to wall, were like, this is going to raise the price of everything. No one's going to be able to afford anything anymore. And the price went up a little in the beginning. And then because of free markets within the United States, it, um, it stabilized and it went back to what it had been before. And so we're protecting American workers and there has been very little impact on the price of steel. There are steel mills popping up all over the country thanks to President Trump. And actually, President Biden, to his credit, kept those tariffs, which is why I like to say I think Trump is the most left-wing president we've ever had because everything left-wing that Biden has done on the economy was simply continuing things that Trump had already done. So I, I think steel and aluminum is a perfect example of how tariffs can work to protect American workers without driving up the prices. And at the end of the day, you know, it could be that their, you know, working class people will no longer be able to get a brand new iPhone every year and a brand new flat screen TV for $75. But I think the choice of whether they would rather have a new flat screen TV in a, in a rental apartment or whether they would rather forgo these cheap goods and be able to afford a home should be posed to the American worker. And when they vote for Trump, they're speaking very loud and clear and saying what it is they want. Now, of course, like what's the connection between the tariffs and the price of housing? Like every it's a mosaic, right? But all of these things together, what we've done is we've weighted the economy solidly in favor of this oligarchic credentialed elites and immigration and trade and housing and college credentialism and the, the diploma ceiling and vocational training. All of these things are pieces of the puzzle and, and honestly, nonpartisan. I mean, this is nonpartisan stuff, right? Like the, the NAFTA, this was signed in law by Democrats. So I think that it's just about creating an economy that is is focused on protecting the most hardworking Americans in the most modest way possible so that they're not living with this economic anxiety. Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I remain in my position on trade that it is overall beneficial to everybody. I do not think that, that taxing imports would, would create a giant boom. I think there would be some winners, but I think it would be a net negative on the whole of everybody. It just as a, like as a side note, um, temporarily i will agree with you if we if we put taxes on imports this is a temporary agreement but if i if i temporarily agree with you for a moment yes if we put taxes on imports we will build up the domestic economy um and it will have a salutary effect on the american worker um it, over the last 40 years something like ha three half three quarters of the world's population has gone from crippling crippling dead children level poverty to being okay and that's been through international trade it's been through markets and globalization like isn't that a moral positive that we should at least consider that we've been able to lift up the rest of the planet from death and starvation when i was a leftist i thought that i thought like when i was on the left i thought you know it's more important to pull an indian child out of crippling poverty than it is to make sure that my neighbor or my cleaning lady is able to achieve a kind of stable American life in a country where really nobody goes hungry, right? I, I used to think that there was sort of like an objective level and all things were equal and the borders didn't matter. And there was this like human community of people and we were all, you know, humans and, and children of God. And what by what right did we say, you know, Americans are more important? I now I I don't think that anymore. I now think there's something gross about selling out your neighbor for somebody you've never met. And I think that it, that requires overcoming a very human component which is to care for the people who are closest to you first and who are slightly for you know care for yourself and your family. 
care for your neighborhood, care for your city, care for your state, care for your country and your countrymen. And I think that Ameri without a strong America, the world is going to be in a much more disastrous place. And I think you cannot have a stable democracy when the majority of the people are downwardly mobile and you don't have a strong middle class. And we are in a very precarious state right now because we are in that state. We are in an oligarchy of the credentialed. There is mass resentment by the working class who know they work much harder than the over-credentialed elites. And there is this view on the left that, you know, a credential is what makes you a citizen. And they do see themselves as part of a more global community. And as a result, they're selling out their neighbors. And I think that is very danger dangerous for democracy. And 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 if America's democracy is not strong, that's going to be bad for the rest of the world too. Well put. Thank and you. I agree with the basic premise that you ought to take care of the people around you in your circle of life uh, more than trying to deal with everything. We are we are an autocentric species that operates in, in concentric circles around us. I don't disagree with some of that. Uh, the, the takeaway, though, if we were to bring it back to trade and trade barriers and things like that, would it not be a good idea to start erecting tariffs between states and Texas taxes imports from Detroit? Because that will force Texas to build up its own uh, auto uh, auto sector. Wouldn't Wouldn't having internal trade barriers and taxes be a good thing then? I think so. The difference between me and you would be I see the nation state as something worthy of you know, defending, you know, there's something important about America. There's something we share as Americans, our constitution, our way of life, our culture. Um, and, and that culture around the constant built around the constitution, around the protection of human rights and, or civil rights, I should say, really, um, there's something I think really, I, I'm a huge, huge patriot. And, um, as such, you know, there is something that distinguishes this country from another country and is worthy of protecting. I mean, those national borders are worthy of protecting. I don't think you can have civil rights outside the context of a nation state and a government you vote for that guarantees and protects them. I mean, there is something about the physical barriers of a country that is related to the civil rights that we hold dear, that we would agree on, are like you know the building blocks of a democracy and 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 the safety that we we cling to and the freedoms that we cling to. There's no one to guarantee those freedoms that you and I both respect and value if we don't agree that there is a national border and that the government we vote for is in some way a spiritual manifestation of those physical borders. And so to me, you know, erecting, it makes no sense. Like, why would we do that? Those are our fellow Americans. They're part of the basic unit of, you know, the, the body politic. Um, and it's different, but, you know, there is a difference between us and Mexico, even though I would go to Mexico, I'm sure the culture there, I think it is actually one of the cultures the most similar to America. Uh, you know, I'm sure like, obviously we've been deeply influenced by, you know, our, our, you know, immigrants here and everything like that in the best possible way. I don't know that I would necessarily, other than the language barrier, like what would you even feel as so significantly different? But it is, it's important to say, no, that, you know, Canada to the North, right? By the way, I mean, I, I think right now what we're witnessing in Canada, like the complete a redaction of civil rights that we assumed were sacred in a Western democracy and are no longer of value to m many, many Canadians who are willing to sort of cede them. And you're seeing a country that's like, looks so similar to us, people speak the same language as us, and yet is so fundamentally different. I mean, like there's something in, in the American that rebels at the idea of ceding, you know, our, our, our free speech, although increasingly not on the left. But, you know, the, the majority of Americans, I think, would be horrified by that. So I really do feel like there is something that makes, you know, and of course, this is the greatest country on earth. <laughs> uh, concede a few points. One, I, I think you're more patriotic than me. And uh, I, and I, I don't mean to say that it's a bad thing, but like kudos, I, I admire that about you. Um, I think you make a very good argument um, about uh, the that there is some sort of uh, spiritual spirit to core of a country. But I think that that argument is better placed when we talk about immigration than say trade. Um, just from a functional perspective, you, you don't think that it would benefit the economy to have internal tariffs though, do you? Like if, if you were to have no, tariffs no, between no. states. Okay. So no, definitely not. And also I, I, I wouldn't want to limit, I wouldn't want to put tariffs on like French wine, you know, or like, you know, I don't know, like there, there, there are things that are like, obviously, a real competitive advantage. Like I, 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 at the end of the day, I think I, I do, I do think the free market is incredibly important. You know, I do think Adam Smith was right that there is a level at which, like, something miraculous happens 
where you know the like there's there it is a miracle right like the price point being the exact meeting point of supply and demand you know um the multiplier effect right where when you have trade between people within a country you know that that there is that multiplier effect where um the gdp goes up and up and up with every trade right like there is something miraculous that happens where benefit is obviously increased by people being able to have as free as possible commerce between themselves. And I believe totally in competitive advantages. Like there are things, you know, there are are rare minerals that we just don't have here. And Mm -hmm. we make really great stuff, you know, and I really like exporting that stuff and making bank off of it. Um, I just think that this has to be done in a way that, you know, if the competitive advantage is simply that you are willing to treat workers worse and as a result make the product of the labor of American workers unaf- unaffordable, you know, th- that is unacceptable because that is not a real competitive advantage. And, you know, in the 70s, one of the things that really made that economy work so well for the working class was that the largest sector of the economy was in, tr- was in uh, manufacturing. And what happened in that case was you had American workers making American cars for American consumers. They were both the producer and the consumer. And so the price point would get set somewhere where the person who was making this car could also reasonably afford this car, right? There was something that happened there um, where the, 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 the boss, it was in the sort of the, the, the corporation, the CEO's interest to pay his workers a living wage because they were the potential consumers of these products that they were making. And now the largest sector of the economy is in finance. You have arbitrage upon arbitrage upon arbitrage, um, which is, it's fe- effectively means you are selling the 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 more the worse you treat your workers, the more profits you make. But also the things American workers make are now no longer affordable to them because in other industries they do not make enough money to buy what they are making. And this has had a huge huge downward pressure impact on wages, but also on exports, you know, things would be much better if people in China, China's middle class cannot afford the things that American workers make. And increasingly, the middle class of other countries cannot afford the things that are being made by people who make $25 an hour or $30 an hour because there's so much downward pressure because of trade specifically coming out of China. And that is a real problem. I mean, if if you like the the the, the argument is that like trade wars are class wars and class wars are trade wars and that this has an impact internationally where you have countries that are now completely made up of people who are producers and not consumers and countries made up of consumers who are not producers anymore and that this is going to be, you know, really really bad for the working class of all countries, but I care the most about ours. Fair. Um I will but uh, one one more follow up question. This isn't even an argument thing. I'm just curious if if the European Union called you in, would you tell them it would be a good idea to break apart that trade network? Do you think it's been beneficial for them? They are they are nation states. They are I think more distinct cultures than the states are within America. Um, would you advise them that they ought to be taxing goods coming from France to Germany and so on and so forth to protect their workers, or would you look, view the European Union as a beneficial thing for the component states? Um, I think. Brexit was a lot like Trump, where you had a situation where the working class was voted totally to exit and the elites were like, what are you doing? This is going to be so bad for you. And in a situation like that, I'll always be on the side of the working class because a democracy means exactly what happened there, which is whether this is going to be bad for them or not, they have the right to have their say and to try it out. And maybe they would change their mind. Maybe they would go back on it and they have the right to do that as well. But it seems, I mean, I, I, I really don't know enough about the nitty gritty of, of the EU and where like, you know, the Spanish working class is at, but I imagine it is extremely similar to what is happening here. And, um, you know, I, 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 I know that, for example, Germany and China are sort of in inverse relations in terms of these sort of internal class wars, um, but they have sectoral bargaining, which is a big, big check on um, both financialization, which has been like very disastrous for working class people, um, and, and and downward pressure of wages. So you have a situation where you know the entire industries in Germany set a wage for you know for auto workers or for you know cafe workers, right? So people who work for Amazon or people who work for Starbucks in Europe make a lot more money than they do here. And um, you know I'm not sure that that's necessarily like something I would 
honestly, something that libertarians will enjoy about the book, I found that people who work at Starbucks and people who work at Amazon really like working at Starbucks and really like yeah, working at Amazon. Yeah, by the way, that was something that I was very much surprised <laughs> by reading the book. I was yeah. like, the people who work at Starbucks and Amazon, and then I, and then I looked into it. I, I did, on this 50s episode I mentioned, I, I really looked into the benefits that say Starbucks offers and I was like, yeah, Starbucks seems to be a great company. Like they, they never- pay up to- Forty thousand dollars for IVF surrogacy or adoption—that's a pretty nice benefit that, like, I don't have, and I'm part of that twenty percent cut yeah. class that we've been talking about. Um, I, I didn't meet any workers at Starbucks, Walmart, or Amazon who didn't really enjoy their jobs, and and Walmart especially used to be really bad. They used to do this stuff where they would sort of schedule people very erratically, um, you know, pay them just under what they had to in order to give them benefits. They did a real turnaround, and now. They hire for management, 70% of people hired for management are hired internally, meaning that they don't have that college requirement, which is amazing. You have Mm -hmm. people who don't have a college degree at Amazon who are working as regional managers and making $240,000 a year. It's, it's really, it's really incredible. And yeah, I mean, they, you know, there's the whole business model is built on sort of cheap products from China. So, you know, on trade, I don't know that I, you know, but, but what they've decided to do, I think because they're a Christian company and because of PR and whatever, they were getting a lot of flack for it was really turn the ship around. And I mean, that's an amazing statistic to get people into management out of, yes. you know, hourly and um, 70% and 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 circumventing that. Whole. And and by the way, they also got rid of, um, you know, this is less an issue for me, but, um, you know, they, they don't make people announce if they are felons. Um, you know, the, most oh, people make yeah. them tick a box if they've right. been accused of a felony and they, they don't do yeah. that. So it's really, yeah. No, that's great. Well, then I'll add like, um, uh, I've, I've had somebody on the show on a bonus episode. The, the supply chain for Walmart is very, very, very careful about slave labor. So I'm, I'm using my words carefully here. I'm not talking about what someone might describe as a wage slave. That is to say, someone who is paid very little, but someone who is forced to do labor. They're very yeah. careful about not having that. Um, I, I want to do an episode at some point on whether Walmart is evil or not. <laughs> um, I, a, a, a friend of mine, do you know, Rick Unger by chance, he's in New York. I, you might've run into him at some point. Um, he, he thinks that Walmart has basically, uh, designed a model that has poor workers that are supplemented by welfare and benefits. So they basically figured out how to, um, how to get cheap labor and have taxpayers pay the benefits. That's, that's what he has a problem up. with. Yeah. Um, so, so that is a common theme that you hear on the left where people will point out that there's sort of this corporate welfare. Um, where people, um, you know, some some high, high, high percentage of people working at in retail, big box stores, um, you know, at fast food restaurants are on some form of welfare. Um, honestly, like I'm sure some of that is bad corporations, but I think a lot of it is also the benefits cliff that I mentioned earlier. Um, mm, I would uh, not be yeah. surprised. I met people who who were turning down offers for full time work because. They were relying on all of these benefits. And so right. I'm not sure that the agency is totally lying with the evil corporations. Yeah, yeah. I think that there yeah. is that benefits clip is a huge part of the problem. Well, the, and the other bit that I'll add to that is um, I think a lot of the a lot of the umbrage with Walmart is deeply classist because you go to Walmart totally. and it's kind of grungy and there are a lot of poor people there. And in my experience, uh, I'll say this. In my experience, affluent people from the Northeast hate white people with funny accents. Like I, like I, when I lived in New York City, the amount of like really mean, like comments that were said about hillbillies that would be wildly inappropriate oh, if totally. you said them about black people. That would be like like record stopping. Like I cannot believe you said that about black people. Would be thrown out as long as they were white and had a funny accent. Fair game. And like those same people are a lot of the same folks that we think of as going to NASCAR, Walmart, things that the elites sneer at. And so I I wonder how much of Walmart is actually just this kind of recycled proxy at hating poor white people. Totally. Uh, To back up a little bit, um, you mentioned sectoral bargaining a moment ago, and we we, we can uh, completely step aside from from arguments for a moment because I genuinely would love to get your input on this. I don't know a lot about this. I have no problem with private sector unions. They make total sense to me uh, rationally and ethically. Um, You're you're having a negotiation between multiple parties within an employment space. And Bacha and I realize that we have more negotiating power if we team up and we form the the pundit union than if we're doing it individually. (laughs) Nothing ethically wrong with that. Nothing irrational about it. It makes total sense to me. Um, I know that in the 50s, about one out of three workers were in a union. Now it's about 10%. And I, my guess is that 
of that 10%, it's mostly public or public sector unions, not private sector unions. I am curious, why do you think unions have declined so much in the United States and what would you do to rebuild them? Um, so there's a, this is a big theme in the book. Um, so 6% of the private sector is unionized and I guess, I think it's much higher. Um, I, I surprise you said 10% because I think, I think that's for overall workers, both public and private, at least the data that I've seen. But that sounds right to me. 6% of private, much higher of public. That sounds much about higher right. Pro but yeah, it's not just 4% of public workers. I think it's closer yeah. to 20 or 30% of yeah. public sector workers, government that workers. That sounds right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so um, um, <laughs> I do, I agree with you, public sector workers, it's weird for them to be unionized because like when they are go into the like the ballot box, like they're literally voting on their, like the yeah. people are going to be. There's not in those like like in, in, a, in a private sector right. negotiation, you have the corporate interests and right. the labor interests, right. and it's it's almost like a adversarial relationship with yes. attorneys, where you've got a defense attorney and a prosecutor, right. and the government is ideally the judge who is neutral in that that right. prospect. With public sector unions, it's more like the prosecutor versus the jury. Right. Like it's it is like weird. it's the, the 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 incentive structure is such that there's no one actually advocating on behalf of the taxpayer. It's just like you know. Right, so so exactly. that's my problem. I'm yes. I'm very FDR when it comes to public sector unions, and I guess private sector unions. I don't know. Um. Yeah. I, I'm. Why do you think that right. there's been a decline in private sector unions? And and it could could they come back? What would you do to bring them back? So the it's very funny because like the the big rise in unionization efforts these days are all in like white collar jobs. Um, and you know, I always joke about it. Like, you know, you have these journalists at like the, the Washington post and the New York times who, you know, the average salary is $160,000 and they're all unionizing. And I'm like, what's next? Uh -huh. Like the CEO's union, you know, yeah. like at some point <laughs> it's like, it doesn't really make a lot of sense anymore. Um, you know, I, I would say, so there's a number of theories about why union is it, unions are not, you know, substantially growing in number. Um, it is made all the more interesting because um, they are extremely popular right now. So they are reaching like near historic highs in popularity, but that is not translating into massive union drives. Like, like it's an abstract been... concept of like, exactly. do you like unions? I love the idea of unions, exactly. but in terms of exactly. do you want to pay union dues to join ones? No. So it's okay. Right. Got it. So, right. So the people I interviewed, would, a lot of them would say, oh yeah, I totally support unions. I think it's a really cool idea. I don't feel like I need one. Um, so there's a number of explanations for why that is. One is um, American workers are very entrepreneurial and hardworking, and they don't want an adversarial relationship with management. They believe, rightly or wrongly, that if they work really hard and show up on time and put in their all, they will be protected and they will get, you know. So there is that sort of that piece of it. I don't think that's the main reason. There is another piece of it, which is that the majority of working class people now um, are, are, are conservative. They're moderates to conservative socially. And the unions have, the national unions have sort of adopted this very woke mentality. Um, and so there's a cultural divide between the leadership of the national unions and where the rank and file are at or where working class people are at. In the South, where a lot of manufacturing has moved, there's um, a very independent spirit. Um, people don't like sort of being told what to do or being seen as mm. part of like a, a group. Um, all of these, I think, are maybe like our pieces of the puzzle. But to me, the real, pe the real reason that people do not see unions as a path to the American dream, despite seeing them as, you know, being able to like raise wages and so forth and, and, and issue protections and so forth is because of immigration. The the unions like the Democratic Party in the 90s did a 180 on immigration. They used to support American workers and support limiting immigration. And then with the Democratic Party, they instead embraced illegal migrants, which to many American workers was simply like representing the competition, the direct competition. And I think for that reason, they, they people felt, these people are not on my side. They're on the people who are sort of undermining us um, that's the theory that I put in the book. All of these are mm. pieces of the puzzle, but that that is the theory that I think is 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 the most compelling to explain this conundrum. Okay, so so they're mostly it's not so much uh, like a structuralist approach to the economy. I, I it's not like um, the Wagner Act being mitigated by Taft Hartley or anything like that. It's it's more cultural so. and it's more reactive to what elites are doing. And I mean, like there 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 is union busting going on here and there, but like I don't know, like people who work at Tesla really like working at Tesla. So like 
are there a bunch of, you know, salt college educated elites who went in there to unionize and got fired and whatever and union bus? Sure, you know, but like in general, like there are places that are just like you, you know, they're good workplaces, whether or not they're unionized. And a lot mm -hmm. of the conversation around unions is is done by people who like went to college to study organizing. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. there is like, really like Star this Starbucks. I don't know why you would unionize at Starbucks. I think their benefits are spectacular. The, be the benefits Starbucks has are literally be better than my benefits as an entrepreneur and better than the benefits of, of uh, the editor that, that contracts with me. Like, like Starbucks has really good. So I don't know why you'd you, like, I feel like management's doing a good job at Starbucks based on what I'm reading. So unless right. you just when really, you ask really people, like yeah, the proletariat and you're just like, yeah, fist in the air, let's sing labor songs. Right. I, like, I don't know what the function would be. Uh, you, you did mention a moment ago that, uh, so I, I think you're right that, that there was a period where labor unions and the democratic party were the the immigrant skeptic group uh, i mean like you don't actually have to go that far back like the 1980s you can watch debates between reagan and george hw bush where they're arguing about who's more pro-immigrant and they're castigating the other guy as the anti-immigrant guy this is within the republican party um and then at some point around like i guess bill clinton because bill clinton is very much a neoliberal a neoliberal pro-immigrant pro-trade guy that's why i like him <laughs> um <laughs> uh, but there's there's a pivot point where the democrats become the Obama, Bill Clinton, neoliberal party, as opposed to the old like 1970s Thomas Frank Labor Party. I, I think that that's true. So part of it is just that the rank and file that would join unions are looking at union leadership going, you guys are talking out of both sides of your mouth. Um, I, I, as a as a worker, view immigrant labor as a threat to my livelihood and you are in favor of immigrants. Therefore, why am I going to give you money? Something to that effect. Yeah, and it's funny because that was around the time that like talk radio started to really blossom um, on the right. And that's why all of the leftists are like, oh, the working class abandoned the Democrats over cultural issues. And it's like, no, you abandoned the working class over trade and immigration. And they knew it and they saw it and they saw it in their pocketbooks and they saw it in their wages and they saw it in their bank accounts. Like they're very canny, canny voters. Working class people think about trade a lot. Like we don't, you think about trade a lot. I think about trade a lot, but most I'm elites, a nerd. Yeah. most elites don't think about trade. They don't think about tariffs at all. Working class people think about tariffs a lot because it impacts their bottom line. And I am of the opinion that a person who has $50 in their bank account and four children to feed and to get to school and back, and they have to fill up the gas tank is not wrong about who put money in their bank account and who took it out. Like it's, when you're living on a shoestring budget, and I know this from times in my life that I was living on a shoestring budget. You, the wins are so important and they have such a massive impact on whether you're going to eat or not. Like, you're not wrong about which policy is good for you, and which policy is bad for you. I think that's such a, you, you know, only people who have thousands of dollars in their bank account, like padding, can think that, can think that a person can be living on a shoestring budget with less than $400 for an emergency, which is most Americans. That's and right. still, you know, be wrong about like which policy would help them and which ones wouldn't. Um, half agree with you there. Uh, I, I don't mean to dismiss anybody that's struggling. I don't think we should be dismissive of people struggling. And I think there are a lot of people struggling. Uh, and I, I, I think that the way we handle the working class in America is contemptible. And a lot of it's cultural. I, 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 I think the stuff in your book about how we treat non-college educated people, which is a big component of the working class is, is contemptible. And we've really, really done a disservice. Um, uh, so I, I agree with a lot of that. I do think you can be, I think you can miss, you can be in a bad situation and have complete validity of determining that the situation is bad and potentially misdiagnose why it's there. So uh, yeah. I, 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 I look at trade and I'm like, I think that that's a misdiagnosis of something you're experiencing. Using data from your book, you, you bring up that I think it's two thirds of American workers make $18 or more per hour. Um, you also bring up that uh, the, the supply problem or that housing is a supply problem, not a demand problem. So looking at this, I'm going the, the, the phenomenon that I see in your book from a data perspective, it seems to me that it's not that salaries are low. If, if two thirds of American workers are making $18 an hour or more, it's that we don't, it's the prices are too high. And that seems to be a supply problem. So I, I don't know how limiting immigration would change that. Uh, if we, if we restrict immigration, 
um, if people are already making $18 an hour, like the, the salary is decent. It's just, we don't have enough houses. So I would look at that and go, the, the big problems that I would tackle are inflation because we're, we're eating people's money away and any savings they can have and say like zoning, which by the way, Bacha absolutely brings up in the book. I was joyous, skipped around the room uh, that Bacha identified zoning as a very big problem. But, but from, from where I'm at, salaries are decent. It's that prices are too high and that the way to deal with that is monetary policy and supply. Why would immigration change this equation? What am I missing? Uh, I'm, I'm very pro-immigration. I'm, I'm on the neoliberal cuck side of this. What am I missing? Well, immigrants have to live in houses. Okay. And so just the, like, like, yeah. The, 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 sh- the housing shortage in America is about 10 million homes, 10 million units, mm-hmm. 8 to 11 million. So, and okay. that's the number of people President Biden just allowed into the country illegally. And they all need to live in housing units, right? Like there's, <laughs> is that not, I mean, uh, supply and demand, like, we just no, doubled that, that, that's, the pressure on every housing unit and every working class family struggling to find one. Okay, um, I guess um, yeah. So, so it's a supply and demand issue. You're 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 thinking that there's there's a limited amount of housing. There's but a limited also amount of- all of those illegal immigrants. Those 10 million people are going to be employed in. Well, a lot of them are living off welfare, which I'm sure we agree on is like completely unconscionable. But um, a lot of them are going to be employed as landscapers, drywall builders, um, cleaning ladies, um, nannies, and in, in healthcare, the bottom end of healthcare, like that immediately is driving down currently the wages of all of those jobs there. I spoke to a janitor in California who had started a janitorial business he was so proud of and so excited about, and it fell apart throughout the course of my reporting the book because he was competing with teams staffed entirely by illegal immigrants. So that is an American who's been put out of work by, that's just one of millions who've been put out of work by just, he was so entrepreneurial. He was working so hard. He was doing everything right to build up this business. And he simply could not compete with teams of people paying, you know, $9 an hour to a bunch of illegals who crossed the border illegally and now have work permits from Venezuela. I mean, it was just, it, it's heartbreak. How can you do that to a person? Like, uh, how can you do that to a black man who's struggling to find dignity who loves cleaning like it, it's so horrible and so that is a man who's never going to be able to buy a home now like they're, they're, they're working class wages were rising but at the same time the cost of the hallmarks of, an, of the american dream were also rising and every additional piece of pressure you put on those things um is is going to make a huge huge impact you know how like when there's a traffic jam right the part the car in the front of the traffic jam um, you know, if he slows down by 10 miles an hour, that's going to lead to, you know, a half hour standstill, like five miles back. There's some, those are the, the wrong numbers, but like the, there's an exponential, the pressure increases exponentially as you go down. That's what's happening here. And they're totally right that these people have been put ahead of them in terms of like the priorities. Like when you think of, they're all being put up in hotels and I'm not saying working class people want to be put up in hotels, but like there is so much energy being being um and, and taxpayer dollars and care and everything being put into pr- making sure these people have somewhere to live. It's so unconscionable when people who work so hard, like they feel like such chumps, like watching this on the news, and they are, and it's it's they've become second class citizens. Um, in terms of of immigration, putting a downward pressure on wages or competing with the janitor that you mentioned there. Um, uh, w- one of the economic concepts that I've learned about the last couple of years is the, the labor lump fallacy. And it's it's the, the, the basic precept of supply and demand is a good one, but that when it comes to labor, labor is dynamic, economies are dynamic, economies grow. If you look at Toad Suck, Texas, it's got fewer workers than New York City, but New York City has higher wages. And despite the fact there's way more uh, employees that are competing for those wages, they're getting paid more. Why is that? If it were p- merely a function of supply and demand, we would assume that Toad Suck would have very high wages, but it's not uh, because the uh, amount of people coming in grows the economy. The economy grows faster than the deficit created by these new jobs. Therefore, everybody benefits. Um, so I, I look at that and go, um, wh- while I acknowledge, I'm going to preempt what you're about to say. Nobody lives in an aggregate GDP. I agree, Bacha. I agree. I've seen into the future. No one lives in a GDP. I agree. But it, it does seem to me that immigration is a, a net benefit for growing the economy. It's a net benefit for 
uh, the the vast majority of people in the economy. But and it, I would just uh, you would just disagree with that as kind of a general concept. Or? No, I totally agree with that. I think that's a big part of where that. 50% of the GDP that has been like radically squeezed up to the top 20% has come from. Yeah. Immigration puts money in the pockets of the elites. That's totally true. Okay. All right. <laughs> and totally <laughs> so, bad. <laughs> so so we, we half agree. We half agree on that one. It's it's somewhat beneficial. Uh, all right. Well, so I'll, I'll let you go here in a second. Um, you, you mentioned Trump at the beginning of this. Uh, and um, uh, we, we we didn't really get into it, but you've 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 said that you think that Trump is the most left wing president we've ever had, or at least since yeah. FDR, something to that effect. Um, are, Including like, are, FDR, are, are, FDR was terrible on trade. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, are, are you are you pro Trump? Are you planning to vote for him? Are you are you endorsing him, stumping for him? Do you like how how should how about one? How do you personally feel about Trump? And then two. For the the neoliberals, libertarians, and moderates that are listening to the program, what would you tell them about Trump? Um, uh, if you're comfortable with the top 20% controlling 50% of the GDP and hoarding the American dream, if you like that, you shouldn't vote for him. Um, I'm an undecided voter. I honestly don't know who I'm going to vote for. I'm, you know, there's things Biden could do to pull, turn this around. I honestly think, you know, the, most of the people I interviewed um, and, and the data backs this up, they want a combination of like a moratorium on immigration and government backed health care. And I honestly think it would be much easier for the Democrats to get to that combination than the Republicans, although the Republicans seem much more interested when I talk about this, like Democrats won't even listen to me and won't let me into even though. I, so but if I, I thought when I wrote this book. Oh, yeah, the Democrats for sure will hear me out. Like, it's so easy. All they have to do is go back to where they were on immigration in the 90s and they could clean up. They could get the whole the whole working class back. They won't even let me say this. But when I say to Republicans, you know, if you guys developed a health care plan, you'd, 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 you'd keep all these Trump voters even after. Trump. They're like, really? That's so interesting. I never thought of it that way. Like, I thought I'd get booed off the stage, but they're like, oh, health. By the way, there's a real opening here for libertarians because the libertarians are the only ones with good answers on healthcare. I mean, the only ones with a real answer to how to like, you know, take a, a chopping block to the cartels in the in the different healthcare industries. I'm sure we would totally agree about that. Like, really, so you, you you would not be in favor of like a British style national health no. insurance type program. You no, wouldn't be in favor no, of a French single no. payer. You you'd rather uh, like cut out all the regulations that are that are Again, causing these I accumulations of power supply right it's like you know that you got to increase the supply and so there's like tons of re stupid regulations there's these they're just basically cartels like running like the hospitals running the insurance companies and running the pharmaceutical companies and they need to be broken up i mean there's a, like need to you know we need more supply like that's it you know like the doctors are really good at protecting their labor you're not going to see like a, 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 you know 10 million doctors fly, you know fl coming flooding in here from from Eastern Europe. Like that's just never going to happen. They're really good uh, at protecting the, their the labor. The American Medical Association yes. has been incredible. I think the American Medical Association is the most effective union in American history and at every step has been great at protecting the income of doctors whenever anybody else enters the equation. They've been right. very them, good at cock blocking anything that would stop doctors from being totally. paid massive amounts. Yeah. But also Maybe I'll do an episode the, of the AMA the, rather than Walmart. It, it's the administrators as well. I mean, the administrative costs. I mean, over the last four years, the the one of the sectors that has been growing by almost 50% has been healthcare. That hasn't been doctors. It's been like DEI and administrators and hospital administrators and all sorts of people who like get in the way of people having affordable health. It is horrific that you cannot know going into a medical procedure how much it's going to cost you. I mean, it is this t totally unacceptable, like disgusting, like treating healthcare like some sort of like and, and it would be so much better if it was just treated like some sort of other, cons you know, consumer benefit, right? Which it's not, and I don't think it should be. But anyway, um, so all of which it'd is be, to say- It'd be more efficient if we treated it like food stamps or something where just you had a very- right. You, you had a big free market and you went, look, if you, if you can't afford it, we'll come up with something to pay the gap as opposed to having this weird Rube Goldberg contraption that's like the worst of socialism right. and exactly. the worst of, of corporate both. malfeasance simultaneously. Everyone I know- who is libertarian or socialist thinks American healthcare is wretched, and I agree with them. I think we've got a really bad healthcare system. I would love it if somebody came up with a uh, a good way to do it. Uh, how about okay? Final, actual, final question for you. Um, 
if if the working class were to have a candidate that espoused their policy solutions, um, what would this candidate look like? What what would that person talk about that would be representing the interests of the working class insofar as you've been able to divine them? They would be very pro-gay and very, very anti-trans agenda. So supportive of gay families and gay couples and gay marriage. No trans people in women's bathrooms, no trans women on women's sports teams. No one's allowed to talk to children about this stuff. They would be very into restricting immigration and very into protecting healthcare and finding a way to like make healthcare more affordable and more available to more Americans. Um, they would be against welfare, but also in favor of ra raising taxes on the rich and on corporations, maybe as a way of funding this healthcare stuff. Um, and overall, they would support the dignity of, of the American worker. They would support, you know, tariffs within reason. And and um, they would be on, on on abortion. Trump was totally there. I mean, you know, 15 weeks exceptions for rape, incest, women, mother's health, you know, and and pretty much illegal after that. But no bans. I mean, like just aggressively, aggressively moderate. That's that's any candidate who's listening to this who picks up this po i mean nobody believes me and nobody seems to be doing it but you could immediately get 60 percent of the vote if you did all of this immediately i think that's my view um, i i think if that were a if if the <laughs> noting that i do not agree with everything you just said but just from a political standpoint if there were a political party that had that as its platform i think it would be a very potent political party in the american electorate um we've and we also like i don't know there's, there's lots of um we, we we don't have a real centrist party anymore. We have we have two parties that are tacking in two different directions, and uh, yeah, I think that that would be a potent thing. So um, uh, people to be thinking about running for president, feel free to take Botch's uh, perspective and run feel with it. Feel free to pick up a copy of Second Class: How the Elites Betrayed America's Working Men and Women, which has a roadmap for immediately coming out of the gate with sixty percent of the vote. Um, thank you so much for having me, Andrew. This has been absolutely wonderful, a true pleasure as always. You are a gentleman and a scholar, and an absolute delight. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Uh, I would love to hang out next time we're in New York. Uh, everybody Absolutely. remember, uh, Bacha has brilliantly negged me and you <laughs> into buying her book. She is absolutely <laughs> nagging us and we are falling for it. Please go. We're, everybody's going to benefit from this. Go to mightyheaton.com slash featured where you'll find her book and tweet Bacha. Bacha, what is your, your Twitter handle again? It's at Bunger Sargon. All right. Let her know that you heard about her on my show and then she'll be more likely to come back. All right, Bacha, come back again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great chat. I really want to get drinks with Bacha and her husband again. We did that like two years ago. It was a lot of fun. You'd like them. You'd like them. Maybe I'll call you. Couple of things. First, Bacha has previously appeared on this program talking about her last book, How the Culture War is a Smokescreen Perpetuated by Self-Serving Elites. I have linked to that in today's show description if you want to hear more Bacha. If you want to see Bacha and you want to see me, I have also posted a link to the aforementioned appearance of her on my TV show, Adults Are Talking with Andrew Heaton. That is in the episode description. You can see me in a snazzy waistcoat and Bacha more or less wiping the floor with me when we argue about trade and immigration. I feel it was more balanced today, although we weren't really fighting. We weren't really arguing, right? That was that was a discussion. We were genuinely seeing each other's perspectives on that. We argue a bit on the TV show, but it's it's still a lot of fun. Speaking of which, that trade and immigration uh, uh, deviance that we've got in, the, in our views there. After today's chat, I would like to do an episode soon on either how trade works and why it's good, where I explain comparative advantage and whatnot, kind of a uh, Heaton does economics with jokes episode, or alternately an episode on is Walmart actually evil? which would be a bit more of a investigative journalism with jokes type thing. Patrons, I'm going to defer to you on this one. Which of those sounds more fun to you? Do you want a why trade is, uh, how trade works and why trade is awesome, or is Walmart evil? I will put up a poll on Patreon, which you can go on and give me your input. And we'll just, we'll go with your decision. How does one access said poll, I hear you ask? By going to patreon.com slash Andrew Heaton, you can support the show, make cool chats like today's discussion with Botcha possible, but also access 
insane amounts of bonus content. Five years worth of weekly bonus episodes. How many bonus episodes is that? No one knows. It's not possible to do the math. There's no way to do it, but it's probably a hundred. I don't know. It's a lot. Anyway, there's a bonus episode of this show every week. So head on over to patreon.com slash Andrew Heaton to become an elite orphan. Or if you were really swayed by Bacha today and you hate the word elite, a good uh, working class union style orphan that's paying union dues to me, the headmaster of the Give me money. Go to patreon.com slash Andrew Heaton. Thanks. That's the show. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Batya Unger Sargon, for coming on to discuss the working class. Thank you, Eric Stipe, who edited today's program. And thank you, patrons, who make it all possible. Until next time, I've been Andrew Heaton, and so have you. <laughs>